This is not your standard breakfast show with Andy Curtis. Love it. Welcome along to Not Your Standard Breakfast Show. It's Wednesday morning. We're live at Prasa. Our guest today is Felicity Laurie of uh, Humans of Hua Hin. Felicity, a very good morning to you. Good morning, Andy. It's nice to see you in the flesh. I, I read your stuff all the time, and we, we chat every now and again on Facebook. It's very rare we actually get a chance to chat with each other in person. That's true. First of all, for the benefit of our listener and our viewer, potentially, because we're filming this for YouTube too, what's your background? So I'm Australian, I was a teacher for over 30 years, came to Hua Hin in 2018 on a visit, liked it, came back in 2019 thinking, you know, to suss the place out and work out if we really wanted to stay here. And I'm just the sort of person who can't do nothing. (laughs) My husband's exceptionally good at just getting on that back deck, on that deck chair and staying there all day and looking at the ocean and periodically dipping himself in the himself in the sea or in the pool but not me I need something to do right so that's what human humans of Wahin or Huahin is it's me doing something for me and at the same time trying to do something for the community what did you teach when you were teaching for all those years uh, everything yeah lots of everything so my major study was French and Italian language wow. and literature okay. um, So when I started in high school, I was teaching French and Italian and English and a year of year eight maths and some social studies and other things that they needed somebody to to do. Um, But then after I'd been in high school for about 10 years, I went back and taught primary school. So I was teaching basically Italian across a primary school at that point. And towards the, the end of my career for about the last Oh, eight or ten years, I was teaching purely kindergarten and year one. Wow. Italian. That's quite an effort. You're teaching Italian to kindergartners? Yeah. My goodness me. Oh, they, they're little sponges. They suck it up at that yes, age. Yes, yes, quite. They learn a lot. Um, yeah, l- taking on another language is not a challenge for them then. It's actually the best time to embark on a a second or subsequent language. So basically then, because of that, you're, you're clearly then a linguist. You, you mm-hmm. obviously speak Italian and French. Yeah. And what started you off doing Humans of Hua Hin? Right, so... Other, other than looking for something to do rather than sitting on the, on the deck, signing your legs. Absolutely. Um, so when I was here, I first started doing some writing about the different eating places that I went to and that attracted some attention from different people who said to me hey you know would you like to do some writing in our publication Um, and that was basically food writing but that wasn't as fulfilling as I was looking for and they were short pieces then there was not a chance for me to sort of sink my teeth into it I Mm. suppose. Um, and the creative writing opportunity is certainly not there if you're doing food reviews. No, no. They have to be much more factual, you're right. Um, so I thought to myself, right, I'd like to start interviewing people. And my very first interviewee was um, Wendy Herbert, who people might know from her being the quiz master at the quiz, quiz night, which is the first Tuesday of every month down at Surf and Sand. And she was fascinating she has an incredible but i know wendy very well because we both used to live in hong kong and she has a fairly dramatic background and radio presenter as well absolutely and um when she gave me feedback after i'd written about her and she said you know you sort of made me tear up i thought yeah you know people don't get many opportunities to see themselves through somebody else's eyes yes that's true and um you know, I wanted the the experience to be very affirming for people. I wanted them to look at themselves and think, you know, hey, I have achieved something and I have done good things with my life. And so my main aim with my stories is for people who know the person I've written about to go, yep, that's exactly that person. And I also want people who haven't met them to think, gee, that's an interesting person. I'd really like to meet them. I'd really like to have the opportunity to know them myself. Actually, Wendy Herbert, who was one of your first subjects, actually recommended me to you fairly soon after. Yes. And you wrote about me, and I thought, well, 
why does anybody want to know about me? But at the end of the day, you know, doing this on a daily basis, people kind of probably wanted to know a little bit about the person behind the voice or the face they see on YouTube. So what was the actual motivation to, to pick, for example, someone like me? Um, I think part of the motivation is that I'm after not what the people that you mentioned the other day and called local luminaries, but people who are who see themselves as ordinary people but are actually doing interesting and extraordinary things. And there are a lot of them here in Huahin. There are people who don't think that they're anything special. I often get that. People say, I don't know why you'd want to write about me. I'm not special. And then when you dig a bit further with them, you find that there's so many interesting things going on in people's lives. I mean, this town is full of passion and it's full of drive and it's full of energy. Whether people are young or old, male or female, Thai or Westerner. Um, and I just find it fascinating. I mean, in saying that, I absolutely hate reality TV and I hate the voyeurism of that. Um, but it's really interesting to bring stories to light and to show people just the magnificence of our town. You, you, you've written about, got to be about 60 people by now or something, isn't it? Uh, actually written, I think, 83. Good God, OK. You've got a fairly good, even mix of Western people and Thai people and men and women, for example. Is that is that by design or it's just kind of happened that way? No, absolutely by design. Um, because I wanted everybody to feel that I was being inclusive in my writing series and that there was opportunities for stories to come from people of all walks of life and all backgrounds. Um, I'm actually looking for people with different, you know, career paths as well. Um, I was really chuffed when I got a while ago to in interview um, a fire dancer, a fire wow. entertainer, okay. who also does um, surf schooling for kids here in Wahin. Um, because they're things that many of us haven't experienced and haven't had the chance to try ourselves. So to see it sort of vicariously through another person um, is good. And, and you do illustrate a lot of your stories with photographs, which are, which are you sourced um, from, the, from the interviewee. Yes. So it's really not just me. It's a collaboration between me and the person I write about. So they agree to generously give me their time. It typically takes two and a half-ish sort of hours. It could be a bit more. It depends where our conversation goes. So, you know, I've got a template that I update from time to time and change things around. But they're the sorts of questions I'd like to ask, but I don't always get to ask them all because it depends where I'm led by the person I'm chatting to. Um, so we spend this time together, I go away and write, and it's usually quite a quick process. Generally turnaround time is less than 48 hours wow. for the person. So they get their story back, and they've got two jobs then. One is to actually um, check it, verify it, and make sure that it's factually correct. And the other one is to approve it, because I'm not going to publish anything if they're not happy with it. That's kind of unusual. Yes. Uh, that obviously would separate you from the journalist side of things. Yes, but I, I want them to be comfortable. Um, sometimes they tell me things, they're very candid with me when we chat, and later they think, hey, that's probably not for general public consumption, can right. we take that out? Or they think, that bit makes me sound a bit too harsh or a bit too something that I don't want to be categorised as. Right, right. So they say, can we take that out? And I say, sure, because that's my promise to them. We were talking about the illustration of the stories that you publish on Humans of Hua Hin. Because um, they're like little stories about the people. It's not an interview as such. It's not, no. um, and, I, and I agree that it's not done in that journalistic way. It's a snapshot. It's like a... A mini biography. It's right, not right. extensive, but it's a picture of them now and how they got to where they are now. What I've noticed also in your writing style, and particularly, obviously, I'm very familiar with it, having gone through the what process you wrote and, yourself, yeah, exactly, <laughs> uh, is that that you kind of. Um, it, it seems like your impression of the person yes. is is very much the basis of the of the story about them. 
uh, and more often than not, you're absolutely on the nose. Mm. It's presumably because of the questions that you're asking, or do you think that there's, there's another reason for that? No, I, I think genuinely I'm a good judge of character, but it's that I listen very carefully and I'm interested in what people tell me but also what they think and feel about what they're telling me. Right, right. Which gives me a lot of information. Um, I, I would put that down to your background as a teacher because it's a very important uh, characteristic of a good teacher to be able to listen yes. and to understand about a child perhaps. Yes, it, it, it's being observant. Um, when we chatted, we chatted over the internet yes um because of covid and i much prefer to chat to people in person i find it much easier but that said i that was the situation that i had to face and you know i made a commitment to all the people that i met that way that when i came back to hui hen we'd have a face to face right and i caught up with every single one of them and i'm proud of that i say what I mean and I mean what I say and you know when I make commitments to people they can trust me and I think that's helped me get so many different people to chat to me and to be so candid mm. and to tell me things they wouldn't tell other people but things that they know they should be happy to express about themselves right. Right. that things that they should be proud of, things that they should have no concerns about other people knowing about them. Uh, and you brought up your latest subject, who's David Froelich from Snakes of Hua Hin, who I interviewed at the end of last year when we were in our, our former location. Fascinating chap. Who recommended him to you, or did you, did you dive straight in to contact him yourself? No, he's one who presented himself to me. I, I found out about him and I thought, that's the guy I need to talk to. So normally everybody I talk to has the opportunity to recommend to further people to me that they think have got interesting stories. Um, but sometimes stories just present themselves and they're too good an opportunity not yes. to take. And I did hear David interviewed on Surf Radio and I thought, you know, there's, In due some, course, that's there's, there's, there's something there. And... Um, you know, he told me a story, an anecdote, which I put in my piece on him, that his parents only found out just two days ago when they read the piece about something that he'd done as a 15-year-old that he'd never confessed. <laughs> so, you know, it, 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 it makes me happy that people feel comfortable enough to be that candid with me. Have you ever sort of let something slip in a story that shouldn't have been there or someone come back to you and said oi why did you publish that I asked you not to no I I haven't um, I have a very kind proofreader in my husband who makes <laughs> sure that you know everything that goes out is meant to have gone out but um, sometimes people tell me things in ways that I can't actually directly quote in my stories I have to you know, dance my, dance my <laughs> way around them. Um, I always ask people, one question I often ask people, I should say, is what have they done in their life now that as a 15-year-old they would never have imagined in their wildest dreams you as possible? You didn't ask me that question, thank God. <laughs> and this one gentleman's reply was along the lines of, um, you know, how many female intimate partners he'd had. Oh. Yes, in, in very graphic terms it was. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to, you know, when I submitted it to him, he said, oh, I love the way, you know, you've talked Skirted about the ladies, <laughs> you know, but, but left it in, left it in because it was honest, but... Yeah, you have, I have to be a bit careful sometimes. I, have, I do have to skirt around it. Yes. Done. You say you've published about eighty odd stories. N no, I have published sixty two on the right. internet. Right. Right. Okay. And I've got seventeen articles currently on hand. Wow. Um, and that's to meet the need of continuing to publish once a week during my six months back in Australia. Right. Um, you can, I, I think you can hear the waves lapping against the shore now. It's quite loud, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's lovely. It's very pleasant sitting here outside Pras. So you should come and visit, dear listener. Uh, let's talk some more uh, with Felicity. Uh, we kind of touched on the photographs which kind of decorate your stories. How important are the photographs? 
they're really crucial. They actually bring my story to life. Right. Um, so the story by themselves really isn't going to work. It needs the photos, and that's why I'm in collaboration with these people. So they get the story submitted to them. They can see what they've said and how I've sort of linked it all together, and they go, oh, yeah, I've got that photo. Right. I've got a photo that'll show that. Um, I always tell people if they've got a photo of themselves as a child, that's really well received by the readers. They really like to look back and, and see what people used to look like yes, when they were little. Yes. Um, a lot of the Thai people I've interviewed have said to me, you know, I've been coming to Hua Hin as long as I can remember from Bangkok. I've got that sort of photo that's obligatory of me on the horse as a chubby kid, you know. <laughs> on the beach, yes. On the beach, riding the horse. <laughs> they've, they've, all, they've all got a photo of that. Or, because or in front of the station. <laughs> yes, yes, that's right. And, you know, they're sort of significant markers in the people's lives. Right. And so the quality of my finished article really hangs on the quality of the photos I'm given. But not the image quality themselves, but the selection that they give me. Right. Sometimes I, I put photos up that are a bit grainy and they're a bit blurred and they're, you know, gone yellow or a bit brown. But it, you know, shows the age of the photo and, you know, the span of this person's life and achievements. I will say, and, and this is not meant to sound... Uh, uh, rude. Uh, our very own Richard was one of your subjects not so long ago, hmm. uh, and there was some information in the in the interview with him that I didn't know about. I didn't know that he he'd had such a storied background, in, particularly also in pirate radio, uh, from many years ago. And one of the photographs that he submitted to you is the only photo I've ever seen of Richard with hair, hmm. and I, I do mean that with with respect. And because I, I thought maybe he was born without hair, because <laughs> it looks it looks like that may be the case but then you've got these little uh, I mean that's that's like a, like you said it's a snapshot from yesterday uh, yes. and and perhaps it is quite important to have that kind of illustration on this on a story about someone's life mm. and with every story that I publish there's possibly something in there that even people who know that particular person well don't know about them oh, a good example of what I, what I just mentioned um, about Richard yeah, so there's a guy I wrote about, Kun Ong, and he's from Pram Porpiang, which he sees as sort of a, a social entity. Um, it's not just an organic farm. It aims at sufficiency for the whole village after, you know, the ideas of King Rama Nine. And um, people know Ong as a farmer, and they know him because he runs Chok Di Market, which happens outside the Sansara Grand, you know, once a month during high season. And he's also involved in the Green Market, which pops up regularly out the front of Market Village. But people who've known Ong for years don't know that he's a pilot for Bangkok Airways oh, wow. and, and okay. flies medium-haul <laughs> flights, you know. So he flies to Phuket and he flies to Malaysia and he flies to Singapore. And he's doing that at the same time. And they'll go, you know, Ong, a pilot? Really? And yeah, he's been doing it for years and years now. Fascinating. You, it must be very interesting, some of the people that you've met, to find out so much about people that you knew nothing about from the beginning. Um, has this, it must have changed your life. Absolutely. And um, there's, there's sort of two strands to it because I'm thinking I'm doing this as a way of contributing to the community and, and to pay back to the community for, you know, the fact that I get to live in this wondrous town, city, I don't know what the mayor wants to call it. <laughs> um, but at the same time, it's giving me something to keep me occupied. My grandmother, many years ago, died with Alzheimer's. My mother is now living, still with dementia at 87. Um, and, you know, I've spoken to my GP about it, and he said, you know, it's not a genetic thing. It's all to do with, you know, environment and staying in contact with people and, and being social and so... Keeping, keeping the grey matter moving, I think, is very Ad, important as well. It, it is. Um, you know, so it's, it's a way of looking after myself. And it's given me an entree into the local community that I wouldn't have had otherwise. And 
some different things bring joy to my heart. Like recently I was able to connect two women who are Malaysian, who both are quilters here in Wahin. And you know, the first one had said to me many years ago when I interviewed her or heading towards two years ago, that she was the only Malaysian woman in Wahin. And I said to her, darling, you're not <laughs> the only Malaysian now. I've got another one for you and she does quilting too, you know. So when I'm able to help people and connect people with similar interests, that, you know, warms my heart. My thanks to Felicity Laurie for joining us on Not Your Standard Breakfast Show. And if you'd like to check out her website and all the other interviews that are featured on Humans of Hua Hin, check out her Facebook page, Humans of Hua Hin.